Welcome everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Um, so obviously I'm going to be focusing on this idea of developing insect management programs. And I'm going to do my best to make this uh, broadly applicable. I am in the Midwest, so most of my work focuses on Midwestern insects and the climate and the, and the seasonal cycles we have here in the Midwest. But I think the general concepts that I'll be talking about are applicable everywhere in the country. So I will welcome at the end, we'll have a nice uh, chat session, a little Q&A session. So I will certainly welcome uh, your questions if I didn't touch on something that is very specific to, <clears throat> excuse me, to the region that you're working in. Hmm. So let me show you, talk a little bit about an overview for this, this uh, presentation. I'm gonna start out by talking about this idea of IPM, integrated pest management, right? And what it is actually, especially in turf grass management. I'll share with you some basic concepts. I'll go into some, some details on a few of those concepts so that we're all on the same page in terms of the language I'm using. From there, I'm going to jump into you know, this idea of how we get started on building a insect management program. And I'll focus a little bit on life cycles of sort of primary targets. You know, this is the foundation for building an insect management program that relies especially on insecticide products. It's important to have a primary target, and it's also important to think about this multiple targeting aspect. We're not just going after sort of one insect at a time at any given time. We, are, we're, we have to think holistically about what other targets might be out there and potentially causing damage in turf. So we'll talk about primary targets, secondary targets in this multiple targeting framework. And that has a lot to do then with insecticide selection, right? The chemistry, the environmental properties, the residual activity of some of the insecticides we have available really sort of make some products better fit for certain solutions than others, right? And it's important that you have an understanding of some of these, uh, these products and their qualities so that you can make really good uh, decisions in terms of the tools you're using and how they fit in sort inside this multiple targeting framework. And I'm going to wrap up by talking about some resources that I think are might be useful to you and how to access those resources. Those include online resources that I've developed that can help you throughout the season. I also have a social media account that I'll just mention briefly and uh, a mobile app that can help you diagnose insect and weed and disease problems in turf and lead you directly to it's a whole library of resources that we have available to help you make decisions. So let's start with this idea of integrated pest management. And what I, I like to think of IPM in terms of what its goals are, right? So what, the, what is the goal of integrated pest management? You know, is it eradication of pests? Probably not, right? Good luck if you're using that approach. It's very difficult to get rid of all pests. Instead, I th like to think of it as a way to keep pests in check, right? To, just to keep them below damaging levels. It doesn't matter if they're there, if they aren't causing damage. That then leads naturally to this question of what is acceptable level of damage, right? And that's going to vary depending on your your own personal ideas of what's acceptable, as well as your clients and, and stakeholders' ideas. I would be willing to guess that of, of any of the three photos that I have there are probably not what you would consider acceptable damage uh, in most cases. So this idea that the pest presence does not necessarily equal a pest problem is an important one. It's okay if we see pests, but once their populations rise to a certain level, then they can become a problem. And that acceptable level of damage is gonna depend on a lot of different factors. And I like to think of it in this sort of three-dimensional uh, framework where you have folks that range from 
very risk averse. Let me get my marker out here. Very risk averse to very damage tolerant, right? Folks that aren't too concerned with a little bit of damage. Uh, there are folks that are very highly informed. They understand insect life cycles. They understand the tools that they have available to them and how they work. And then there are those that uh, aren't so uh, savvy on some of this information. And then lastly, I like to think of folks that, in terms of environmental consciousness, right? We know that we have impacts outside of uh, just the turf system. And so are the tools that we use can have unforeseen consequences. There are those that are very environmentally conscious and there, there are those that are indifferent, really don't really care too much about that side of the issue. I'm willing to guess that most of us lie somewhere here toward the middle of this, of this uh, set of axes, but knowing that most of you are trained uh, as turf grass managers, you're doing this as a profession, I, I suspect that we're more out laying outside in this sort of the uh, informed, environmentally conscious, and fairly risk averse, right? We're not really likely to put up with too much damage because our clientele and our stakeholders aren't likely to tolerate. It. So that's the framework I think it's helpful to go into when we're thinking about designing these insect management programs. So in terms of some basic concepts, I think it's important to understand that there are both proactive measures and there are reactive measures. So some of those important proactive measures are cultural practices, the idea of creating a favorable condition for the plant, and at the same time, the flip side of that coin, creating unfavorable conditions for the pests. Another proactive sort of aspect of turf grass insect management is biological control, in particular conservation biological control. I'll get into some of the details on this, it's not complicated, but the idea that we're trying to promote some level of stability in that turf grass ecosystem, and it is an ecosystem. We're trying to promote stability and, and try to make sure that we limit the opportunities that pests have for their populations to get out of control. And we do that by leaning heavily on the natural enemies that are already present and trying to conserve them. The last aspect I th that I think of as a, a proactive measure are preventive applications of some sort of insecticidal product, right? These typically are insecticide applications made to high risk areas or areas that have suffered damage in the past. So we're making these applications based on our experience or also our propensity to uh, avoid damage when we, when we have to, right? Certain areas of certain lawns, certain golf courses where we're gonna be very sort of timid about tolerating too much damage. So we might take a preventive approach in those instances. The second part of this, this, this then is the reactive measures, right? These are things we do after the fact to manage a problem that is coming into existence, that's happening be before our eyes, right? So we can take this approach of repairing the damage that we see, we can renovate these areas to some uh, better suited turf grass or just renovate the areas that are damaged in hopes that it will recover. But then the second part of that are curative applications, right? These are a response to a potential or ongoing problem. And when I say a potential problem, what I mean is that you're seeing these insects present, uh, we're relying on monitoring to some extent here when we're using these curative applications, right? If we see high pest populations, we can make a curative application right there at the beginning and the onset of damage. And and sort of reverse course, give that up turf an opportunity to recover. So in terms of so our preventive or our proactive measures, cultural practices are the foundation for insect pest management, right? We're trying to create favorable conditions for the plant that gives it an opportunity to, well, first of all, less likely to suffer insect damage. And then secondly, more able to recover from insect damage should it occur. 
So the foundation for that is soil health, right? right? We wanna to try to do everything we can possible to promote soil health, right? And, and here's a nice diagram of that. These principles of soil health come into play, right? We maximize living roots in the soil and we maximize soil cover, right? We do a good job of that in a turf system, right? We have a perennial crop that always has roots in the soil and in theory always provides good cover to the soil with a nice dense canopy. When we talk about minimizing disturbances, I'm not talking necessarily about physical disturbances, although that is part of it. What I mean are disturbances like uh, chemical, uh, chemical uh, applications that, that are likely to disrupt the balance between some of those players, those natural enemies and the pests. And then we wanna maximize biodiversity, especially in the soil microbial community, right? That makes the soil community much more resilient so that it's always functioning and slowly releasing nutrients to the plants, then the plant's gonna have access to water and nutrients on a more stable fashion. One, I think, often overlooked uh, aspect of these cultural practices is mowing height, right? As we know, as, in, as mowing height increases, so does the depth of the roots in that soil, right? And so the other way to look at that is the shorter we mow, the less deep the roots are, the shallower the roots, and then the more maintenance intensive that turf grass becomes. And I take, for instance, a golf course putting green versus a typical higher cut lawn situation. We know that it's a lot harder to manage that turf at that tenth of an inch than it is at three or four inches. And that goes hand in hand with, mow, with decreasing mowing frequency, right? If you're like me and you mow your lawn at four inches, well, we're trying to follow this one third rule, right? Never move, remove more than one third of the plant tissue. So I can wait until the grass gets to be six inches before I mow off the top two and I can reduce my mowing frequency to about 10 days. Now, I understand that in most cases you don't have control over that, but I do think it's worth considering communicating this to your clientele, right? If there are folks that, man that mow their own grass, but you manage it, uh, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't hurt to suggest to them to raise their mowing height and decrease their mowing frequency. It just makes the plants more resilient to damage. So the other side of that coin of creating favorable conditions for plants is creating unfavorable conditions for pests. And we, one quick way or what sort of one straightforward way of doing that is implementing pest resistant, resistant turf grasses. Now, yes, renovation may not always be an option, but there are some grasses that do provide some resistance to turf grass insects. In particular, endophyte enhanced or endophytic turf grasses, right? These are turf grasses that have a fungal partner growing inside the plant that provides the plant with a bunch of toxins that defend it against insects. You'll notice on this list of grasses, several that are familiar like tall fescue, creeping red fescue, perennial ryegrass, and some of these other fescues are known to harbor these endophytes, these fungal endophytes. So these grasses are really not just more insect resistant, but they're more environmentally tolerant. Let's say they're better, they have better drought resistance. Uh, they're more resistant to, uh, to mineral deficiencies, right? They do a better job of extracting minerals from the soil. So if it's possible to implement these kinds of grasses into a, a turf system, then it's, it's a really, it really helps us lay a good foundation for creating a pest resistant environment. Now, I will say these endophytes in particular are only effective against the above, the above ground insects, but that's a lot of our insect pests are above ground. They may not be the most important ones that you think of right away, but if we can knock most of those off of our, our slate to begin with by implementing these resistant grasses, then we only have to worry about a few more from a management perspective. One way that we can implement this, we don't have to renovate an entire stand of turf grass to, to get these plants in there. We can overseed using various techniques 
and allow that turf to establish. And over time, it will, it will become an important part of that stand and it will be a representative part of that stand enough so that we can really reduce the, the level and the damage caused by above ground insects. So I talked a little bit about this, this conservation biological control. I wanna just give you a couple details here, right? Basically, this is an effort to conserve the natural enemies that are going to be feeding on and attacking the pest insects in the system, right? We think about things like spiders and some of our ground beetles, other arthropods, they're always present in these turf systems, even though they don't cause damage to the turf. And some people may think they're a little bit creepy and don't really wanna know about them. This isn't something that you may generally see. They're in the canopy, they're doing their job in there. And the best that tool that we have available to promote the stability of the system is reducing or minimizing the use of contact insecticides when possible, right? We don't always have a lot of flexibility and, and, and having these, these insecticides available that work through contact, they tend to work very quickly and, and have very good quick knockdown of a pest problem. But if we're making repeated applications of those kinds of insecticides, they aren't very selective, right? They work through contact, so they're also going to be killing the natural enemies in the system and make that system sort of more susceptible uh, to damage from the pests. Because once you knock out the natural enemies, I can guarantee you which kind of insects are gonna to return to that system first. It's gonna be the pests because their food source is still there. It's gonna take a while for these natural enemies to recover and get the upper hand on the pest populations. Then lastly here, I want to mention again, preventive applications, right? These are usually uh, using extended residual systemic insecticides, right? Think, think in terms of our anthranilic diamides and our neonicotinoids in particular, right? These, we know that these, these insecticides have extended residual activity. They hang around in the environment for you know, quite a while, and they're also taken up by the plants so the plant arms itself with that chemistry and any insect that goes to feed on that plant then gets a dose of that insecticide. Of course, that diminishes over time, but most of our residual systemic insecticides have pretty good systemic and residual properties. So knowing that we can use those tools as part of a, as part of a, a preventive application or preventive uh, program. Right? And mainly, again, we're talking about high risk areas or areas that have suffered damage based on your experience. It's never a bad idea to go ahead and think about using a preventive program on those areas. So I wanna walk through a couple of examples, right? The idea of, okay, so how do we get started on implementing a, a management program based on the criteria that I've laid out? Right, there are tons of ways to do this, but this is sort of the approach that I've arrived at uh, based on, you know, lots of experimentation um, and, and, and knowing the, the efficacy and the various aspects of some of these tools that we have available. I like to think of the first step as, you know, again, sound cultural practices. But once you've done that, or once you've done all you can in terms of promoting good cultural practices, the next step I think that's important is to identify your primary target what is the insect that you are most concerned about, right? Is it white grubs? That's a pretty typical answer. Is it bill bugs? That's another pretty typical answer, especially in, in uh, lawn care and in athletic fields, right? But what is the insect then that you definitely don't want to have damage from or that you're particularly concerned about, right? And then anchor the program that you build around that insect, right? Use that as the linchpin and devise a strategy based on the different chemistries you have available or different approaches to build out a program from that point. So let me walk you through an example or two, actually two examples. So here we have the case where our primary target is white grubs. This is pretty common, right? We know that the, adult, the adults don't cause any damage, but the larvae do. 
Um, on the bottom, you see sort of this primary damage. Uh, this is Japanese beetle in this instance where the turf has become, you know, is basically collapsed because it doesn't have any roots anymore. The, the larvae have chewed them off. And then on the photo on the right, we have this second, what I consider secondary damage where animals have found that infestation and really started to shred the sod looking for those as a food source. So we've got two problems here, but the main concern is reducing the larval numbers in those situations so that we don't have either problem occurring. Well, it's worth knowing a little bit about the life cycle of that insect. So using Japanese beetle as the model for all of our annual white grubs, they all have a very similar life cycle to this. We know that they overwinter as, as larvae, as pretty big larvae. They do a little bit of feeding in the spring, depending on the species. Sometimes you can see some damage to the turf in the spring. Japanese beetle, that's not very common. Uh, they'll pupate there in that sort of May and early June timeframe, and they will emerge as adults, at least in this part of the country, they emerge in late June. Uh, depending on you where, uh, where you are, the window moves a week or two either direction. Those adults fly, they mate, and they lay eggs in the soil, and they start the cycle over. So we have a couple of opportunities or a couple of ways to manage them. We can manage them preventively by going out before, with, uh, before there's any damage or any grubs actually in the soil feeding with some sort of a preventive chemistry and put that down as a protective barrier, use it prophylactically, right? To prevent the possibility of grub damage from occurring. The next window then I think of as early curative, that is, when there are eggs and maybe larvae in the soil, but before damage has become visible, right? That's gonna require some monitoring or scouting to implement that approach. But the idea is that if you know there are eggs or larvae there, you can go in with a chemistry that's appropriate for that time and make an application and make sure that they don't cause a problem. There's gonna be a lot of similarity between the materials that you can use preventively and early curatively. The last window of opportunity is what I think of as a late curative approach. And that's after we've started to see damage. So we know the grubs are there, they're causing damage. We wanna stop that and give the turf a chance to recover. And there are a different set of chemistries or a subset of chemistries that are appropriate for that. Chemistries and biological controls or other tools that we have. So, after that, then those grubs are going to go deeper into the soil profile. They're not going to be exposed to any chemistry or any control measures that we try to implement by late October and November, at least if you're in the Northern climates. And then those are gonna spend the winter and start the life cycle over the following spring. So, right, so based on this life cycle, we have some chemistries that, that I've sort of highlighted here as uh, appropriate for a preventive approach, an early curative approach, and a late curative approach. And you'll notice that almost, well, all of our chemistries work in, that we have available work in an early curative fashion, right? We have really good opportunities right there, sort of in the, in, when those eggs are hatching, when those first instar larvae are in the soil, they're not big enough to cause any damage but they're also very susceptible to almost any soil chemistry that we throw at them. Um, the preventive list is a subset of that, and then the late curative list is another subset of those chemistries. That's one way to think of it. Another way to think about this is efficacy by time of application. So if we look at the new, if we, let's start at the top. If we look at something like trichlorophon, right, Dilox, we know it's a good insect grub insecticide, but it's really best if we're targeting those early instar grubs, right? Right after egg hatch, it's a, it, we see the best efficacy here about mid-July. And that's true just to, with just about every chemistry that we have available to us for turf ins insects or grub insecticides. My data repeatedly shows that mid-July is about the best time to make an application. Now that does not obviously fit very well with some of our operations. So 
we have to rely on some of these other chemistries if we're going to go out and make our rounds or make our applications earlier, say in June, which is pretty typical uh, for a lawn care operator to get that material in place. And our neonicotinoids and diamides give us an opportunity to do that. So while neonicotinoids provide good control as early as early May, they'll, if you put that application down, it could provide control of white grubs that don't appear until July, right? So that's what I mean by a preventive application. The diamides, at least two of them, chlorentronyloprol and cyanotronyloprol, really take that to the extreme. You could even push that window further back. I don't recommend it. Um, and I can't think of a real good reason to do that, um, at least based on the seasonal biology of the insect, but they'll provide really good control preventively up through early curatively and a little bit into the later curative window, but their efficacy drops off as we get into the third instar grubs that are appearing in the late summer and early fall. So one thing to, so, so this is another way to think about the efficacy of some of these compounds, that is by application date. Do they have the residual capacity to carry through or are they more of a put the material down right when the grubs are actively feeding and get good control? See, two different, slightly different strategies and there are chemistries that are suitable for each of those strategies. Then, okay, so grubs are our, our, our in this example, are our primary target. But you can see we have a whole plethora of secondary, potential secondary targets, our bill bugs, our caterpillars, our chinch bugs. And you can see here that of our white grub insecticides, there are a lot of them that are gonna provide good protection or are going to be very, very active against bill bugs, caterpillars, and just draw that up here. And some even are active against chinch bugs. These are long residual chemistries for the most part, right? Our diamides and our neonicotinoids. They're going to provide that opportunity, put that material down and get control of other insects that are likely to come in later. One good example of this is uh, here in the Midwest a few, couple of years ago, we had a, a fall armyworm outbreak. It doesn't happen very often, but occasionally, you know, we get these uh, tropical storms that'll blow them up here and then they're all over the place. And that happens in late summer and in, into the fall. And so lawns that had, lawn care operators that had put down uh, chlorantronyloprol or uh, cyanotronyloprol in place for grub control did not have any problems resulting from caterpillars that came, those fall armyworm caterpillars that came later in the year because there was enough residual efficacy to, to carry over and protect those, the, that turf grass. So that's what I mean by thinking about chemistry, longevity or residual activity of the chemistry and this target spectrum that you're interested in covering. I'll give one more quick example, and this is bill bugs. Um, oftentimes in, in home lawns, bill bugs go unnoticed, but I think of them as a potential primary target, right? We have a couple of different species. They have different life cycles, um, but they get active early in the year. The adults over winter, they start to lay eggs here in this uh, in, by May. And so that's the time you wanna have an application in place to, pre to prevent damage from bill bugs. This is bluegrass billbug. We have another one, hunting billbug, that comes out of the winter as two separate cohorts. Some are adults, some are larvae. Complicates things a bit, but the idea is if you're going after these insects, right, we can go after them in a couple of different ways. We have some chemistries that are going to be preventive. That is, they are going to kill adults before they have the chance to lay eggs. Some of them are going to have that plant systemic activity. So they're going to kill larvae inside the stems. Once the adults have laid eggs, the plant arms itself. When that egg hatches inside the stem and that larva takes its first bite of plant material, that, mater that chemistry is already in place and takes care of that insect. And then lastly, we have a different subset of chemistries that are appropriate for going after larvae in the soil once damage has already started to appear. This would be uh, in, at least in the Midwest, it's in the late June 
time frame in Florida, you know, you're going to have a continuous cycle, but the concept is the same. Certain chemistries are going to be better than others at treating curatively versus preventively. Again, same chart that I showed you earlier, right? Thinking about the other insects that these, act, these chemistries are going to have activity against. Now, bill bugs occur earlier in the year than most of our other pests. So if you're going after bill bugs, it might be worthwhile to consider one of these chemistries that also has good residual activity and good specific activity against white grubs, right? The idea being that you can take out care of the bill bugs and get enough residual activity that you don't have to make another application for white grubs, especially if you're using the higher end of the rate spectrum, right? That's something to consider when you're trying to build efficiency into your insecticide programming, right? Think about other targets, think about residual activity and timing. So let me just recap that real quickly. Think when you're developing these insect management programs, it's worthwhile to think proactively, right? Have a plan in mind, think about implementing those cultural practices or telling your clientele to try and encourage them to implement sound cultural practices. Practice biological or conservation biological control by making, uh, reducing contact, the applications of contact insecticides or making better choices or different choices in terms of the contact activity of the materials that you're using. And then identify that primary target. What is the insect you're most concerned about? And then what are those secondary targets that are of concern, right? Are you interested in white grubs and bill bugs, bill bugs and army worms, et cetera, sod web worms? If you, can, if you can implement a program that takes care of the primary target and some of the secondary targets, it really does reduce the, it's gonna reduce the time and amount of material that you're going to be using to, to, to implement a control strategy. And then you gotta select those tools appropriately based on their chemical properties and implement them at the right time. Let me, uh, and I'm just gonna pop up that link so that people can access it. Yeah, okay. did you have a few more slides to go through? I, I, I do, but we are getting close to time. I don't want to hold people too long. Okay. Uh, here, I'll stick this in there. Okay, so there's the link to the quiz. It says Survey Monkey. Go ahead and take that. And um, as we don't have uh, any questions that are in there now, uh, while they're taking the quiz, if you want, you can go over some of those couple last slides um, or, or, or any of that? You can discuss any of that? Sure, sure. Let me just uh, hit a couple of high points here. Um, I yeah. do have a tool here. It's a, it's a mobile app that uh, it's $1.99 and we're working on making it free. We're, we're going to be updating it, but this is a, a, the Turf Doctor app, help you diagnose weed, disease, insect, and nuisance animal problems and give you links directly to our bulletins uh, from Purdue Extension that deal with those issues. So think about that. That might be a handy tool for you in the field. Um, I have my Extension website has a bunch of stuff on our research and all of the bulletins that I've created as a resource for you. Everything that I've talked about today, you can find in, <clears throat> in these online Extension bulletins. And then lastly, I do have a social media account. My handle is at Dr. D. Rich. I use it only for pushing out observations, field observations, and timely information related to insect management and turf grass. No pictures of what I'm having for dinner or anything like that, I promise you, <laughs> uh, even though I sometimes like looking at those pictures. But um, yeah, so that's, that's another resource if you want to give me a follow. I, uh, I tweet every so often during the season and try to make it very, uh, very useful information. Thank you. Great presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you again.